what's my privilege this morning to introduce to you pastors Jerry and Beth Heath from Endurance Church in West Plains. We welcome you, Pastor. Take your liberty. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so good to be with you today. Uh, some of you don't know my wife and I, but many of you do. Uh, we used to be the youth pastors here back in the late 90s, and uh, we ended up moving to West Plains, Missouri, which is about 50, 55 minutes from here north, and um, it's, it's been an amazing thing to be able to come back and to see family, um, to see some of the students that used to be in our youth ministry uh, the adults that used to help us, that were youth staff, and uh, so many different things. It was an amazing time for us here at this church. And a matter of fact, we used to have our youth ministry up in the upper room in the other building. So I was told today that was all ripped out and remodeled. And so we had a lot of great memories up there, a lot of great things happening. So uh, again, my name is Jerry Heath. I'm the pastor at Endurance Church in West Plains. My wife, Beth, came with me today. Uh, we've been married for 28 years. We've got a 25-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son. He just got married two Saturdays ago. I got the privilege to do his wedding. And so um, pretty neat to see. We got our first grandbaby, uh, what, four weeks ago or so, somewhere in there, three weeks ago. Um, so it's a really neat thing to watch your kids grow up, to uh, be able to see family, and then to be able to come back here. That was about 25 years ago that we youth pastored here. And so to be able to come back here and see everybody that was in the youth ministry now have kids is a crazy thing. So, I mean, I'm seeing Nathaniel and Gabe and I'm seeing Jared and all these different people, Kara, um, you know, with kids and grown up. And we used to have an amazing time together. I got a lot of great memories here. And thank you for having us back. You guys are in a time right now in your church where you haven't had to have a transition for quite a while. Matter of fact, my wife and I came back and spoke a Valentine's banquet. I believe it was around 14 years ago. We came and Pastor Chris invited us to come and do a Valentine's banquet for you. And so we made some new friends then. And uh, right now during this time of transition, you're getting a lot of people coming in and speaking. You're going to have a lot of uh, uh, resumes sent, I'm sure, from pastors that want to be in this area. So let me just say this as we start out today before we talk about legacy, and that would be this, show some grace to your leaders that you have, because it is a hard thing trying to pray over, trying to listen to every uh, interview, trying to narrow it down. I don't know if you guys are narrowing it down from 50 applications down to five, uh, usually it's stuff like that. That's a hard deal because you want to make sure that you get the right pastor in. And, you know, as you speak about legacy today and think about that, I know that Pastor Chris left an incredible legacy was it for the last 14 years. Um, when we had the 2017 flood in West Plains, we had what they called the thousand year flood. And when that happened, uh, Mark gave me a call. I was in Mark and Patty's wedding. So, um, a lot of great memories again, like I said, but Mark, Mark called me and said, Hey, we want to help your church. We had gotten flooded. There were 77 water rescues in city limits in West Plains in 2017. That's how flooded we got. We lost, I believe 50 businesses, uh, 50 plus homes. Uh, that had to come in and be all remodeled. And Pastor Chris, when I got in touch with him, he said, hey, we want to help you. We want to send a check to your church because we had, I don't know, thousands upon thousands and thousands of dollars in damages. And so I just want to say thank you to you guys because of your giving. You helped a church that was about 50 miles away from here get back on its feet and start over when we had the worst flooding we've ever seen. And so would you give yourselves a hand? I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your giving with that. So here's what we've got today, legacy. Uh, I want to talk to you about spiritual DNA and about legacy because it's, uh, like I said, I got to come back and do the Valentine's banquet, but about 25 years ago, uh, we were youth pastors here. And so to look at what's happening in this area, um, Corey Tim Boone, anybody familiar with her? Uh, and again, I don't know, you know, you have to hold every word with a grain of salt, but she was flying over this area and had prophesied that she saw God pouring his spirit out over this area. And there's been other things that have been said about this area. I would say over northern Arkansas, I would say that southern Missouri would be in with that. 
And so we are beginning to see finally at our church, we've been there 25 years, we're finally starting to see the harvest come in. In the last 18 months at Endurance Church, we've had 115 water baptisms from people that did not go to church. So we are seeing God begin to do something great. The reason I tell you that is this, it has taken a long time. We, we'll be there 13 years as lead pastors. Uh, we were there for 13 years almost for youth pastors. So we've been at our one church for 25 plus years. And I'm just telling you this much, it takes a long time to get everything in place, uh, to see things happen. And I want to tell you this, do not give up on that dream that you have in your heart. If that's happening 50 minutes from you guys here, there's no reason why you guys can't see that type of move of God here. Matter of fact, I was just watching, uh, maybe it was a week or two weeks before Pastor Chris ended up leaving, you guys had water baptisms right up here. And I'm going to tell you something, a church with a dry water baptism tank is not growing. Is anybody with me? But you guys are growing, and that's a great sign. So as we talk about legacy today, um, man, just again, so many great things that are happening. I want to talk to you about Abraham. Um, now, this isn't going to be the typical, I've heard this story before. We're going to be in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 this morning. And as I come to you today, I want you to really think about this word legacy. So you won't find the word legacy all spelled out in the Bible actually like this. But what you'll see is the word inheritance or you'll see the word favor, all those things pour into legacy. And so when you begin to look at the bigger picture here, um, you know, what is legacy? Well, it was said that legacy is planting seeds in a garden that you never get to see. Part of that's true. How many of you guys have a legacy of someone that poured into your life that still lives on? An example would be my, my little brother. My little brother uh, was handicapped. He had brain damage. He was born with holes in his brain. He had cerebral palsy as well. And so Jamie was very dear to us. Beth and I built our home next to my parents so that we could help take care of my brother. It required 24-7. So as we did that, um, Jamie ended up getting um, hepatitis C through a hospital. We don't know how it happened, but it caused liver cancer, and he died on us. So Jamie's legacy, eight years later, it's been very hard to talk about because he was so special to us. But my wife and I just talked about this today. Can we talk about Jamie without crying? <laughs> Anybody with me? It's hard to do. But the thing is, his legacy lives on inside of our hearts because we loved for him, we cared for him, and he loved us. So yeah, there is a legacy that goes on even when someone passes. But I am here to tell you today that there's a legacy that you can see with your very own eyes while you're still alive that takes effect. And I'm going to share a story at the end today that I think will make an impact with you to not give up at this church ever. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So God's favor was going to be upon Abraham because God had a legacy that God was doing. He says, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and, and you, all of the families of the earth, will be blessed. How many of you guys are like, that's a pretty cool promise right there. That's the kind of promise I would like, right? I mean, if anybody messes with me or my family, God's going to nail them. Is anybody with me? That's what he said, right? That's a pretty cool promise. So looking back over this in West Plains, uh, the journey that my wife and I have taken when we started ministry, we got married uh, in April of 1995. So in January of 1996, this was our very first pastoring job here at Highland. And so we left in January of 1998. We went back to West Plains to our home church where we were in the youth group. We took over as youth pastors and have been there ever since. And, uh, you know, I had to question the journey. I'm like, God, that, that's not what we had in mind. We, we didn't see that coming like that. And, and we didn't even ask for that like that. But it happened. And when you look at the whole journey, what's interesting is um, when I played football there, I was the first person, I was a running back, I, made, I was the very first football player to make all state in our school at West Plains. I broke the school rushing record, which was held in 1976, it was set. I broke that in 1992. I held that until maybe about six years ago, and then another guy came and did that. When we moved back to West Plains, my head football coach asked me to come and volunteer for the football team. You want to know how we grew our youth ministry? Just like that. 
So for four days a week, I was out there at football practices from junior high to freshman to JV to varsity. And um, what happened was I, I always wondered, God, why did you allow me to do that in high school? Because years later, it would swing around full circle to where I would have a platform and a, a, a door, an open door, to go into that high school and to be able to reach that football team. And we had some of the greatest days in our youth ministry with the football team and all the people that were coming. And it was amazing to watch the journey because I would have never thought that would have happened. And then years later, when we became lead pastors, um, we had an incident happen at our church where we had a gunman come. Uh, he had a dagger in his back pocket, had a rifle with 100 rounds. He was trying to break into our church. Um, we had something supernatural happen, which was amazing. We have him on video trying to kick in our glass doors, and yet one of our main front doors was propped open, and he never saw it. On video, he walked past it three times and never even saw the front door open. So there was supernatural there. But when I noticed the front door was open, he then turned around and he came up. I had to hold him at gunpoint. We made the national news. We made KY3, everything. I started getting phone calls on how do you have church security? What do you do with all that? Well, that opened a door for me. I, I, I wouldn't have wanted to go through that as a pastor. But if I weren't there with that gun holding him there, he would have come in and hurt those kids. That's how bad that got. So I learned a lesson off that. There's times that God protects you supernaturally, and there's other times that he's going to use you to step up to protect people. And that's a godly thing. So that opened the door. The police department called me and said, hey, you're the only pastor that we know that carries. Would you be our chaplain? And so I guess it took that to make the news. So from 2015 on, I got, my, I got commissioned, went through the sheriff association, got my commission with the sheriff department, police department. Um, I did all their death notices. We, we did all kinds of stuff. I would have never seen that coming. And so as a commissioned uh, deputy and then officer, uh, I saw things out there that I did not see as a pastor, which was insane. And when you put both those things together with church and community, I'm going to tell you something, that opens your eyes and changes you. So we were able to start many compassion ministries because of that. And again, I'm telling you all that for this. There is a legacy and a plan that God's got for you that you'll never see coming, but he's going to open the doors and he'll even use some bad situations to do it. But he has a legacy that he wants to leave and that legacy is to reach people. So as you look at our text this morning, God's telling Abraham, listen, you're going to leave a legacy and I'm going to use you to leave that legacy here on earth. But understand this, I'm going to do it through you. So God always works through people. How did Jesus come to this earth? He picked Mary. Mary had a baby, and it was baby Jesus. He always uses people to leave a legacy or to, to do his will, okay? And it's an amazing thing so, because to be used by God is an incredible thing. It's an amazing thing to be used by God and see. And how is this going to happen? It's God's plan. Go with me to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 again, and let me show you this. This is interesting. Five times. God tells Abraham, I will. So it's not about Abraham, it's about God. But does Abraham have a part in it? Yes, he does. He needs to be obedient to God. What if Abraham never would have left? What if he would have stayed there? I mean, think about that. If he was in disobedience, do you realize you and I would not be sitting here today? Because of Abraham's obedience and that legacy, you and I are sitting in this church today. Jesus Christ is the only one who could fulfill the promise that God gave to Abraham. Fulfill it all. And he did. In Hebrews, I think, 9, 14, it says that Jesus is the one who fulfilled the entire promise of Abraham. And guess who we have living inside our lives? Guess who is our Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. So what's interesting is this. He says this, now the Lord said to Abram, I want you to go from your country and your kindred, and I want you to go to your father's house. The land that, what does it say? I will show you. Verse two, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, okay? I will uh, make your name great so that you're a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. What does he say there again? I will curse. So understand this, while you're creating a legacy here at Highland, you have to understand that God's behind the entire scene and he's the one that's directing your life. You know, just like I used to tell all of our youth all the time, and um, I really realized this, what you toy with will eventually make you its toy. What you play around with is going to turn on you. So, you know, a puppet on strings, basically. But 
it, it is the same way with God. If you'll give God all your time and your obedience, then God in return is going to have your back. You know, it's very interesting to me. We'll hit point two in a second, but I want to talk about God's hand in favor. Um, if you read through the book of Ezra, a lot of people skip over a lot of the Old Testament books, but it is so powerful because the book of Ezra says that God's gracious hand was upon Ezra, especially in chapters six, seven, and eight. Ezra said, God, your gracious hand is upon me so we didn't get uh, beat up and killed by bandits. God, your gracious hand is upon me. We didn't need any resources from the king because you're the one who supplied it. God, your gracious hand was upon us that we were able to do this and do that. It's an amazing book. And what it is is this. God has a legacy and a plan, but he uses people to do it, and he puts his hand upon people. He puts his favor upon people. And Highland, I don't know what you guys are looking for, but if it's for Jesus and Jesus to change lives, you are a part of that legacy and he will have your back. I know you're looking for a leader right now. It's a very important thing. God gives to the church pastors. And if you'll read in Ephesians where it says that God gives these gifts to the church, a pastor is one of those gifts. That's how you're to treat a pastor. God is giving you a pastor to be a gift to you so that that pastor can help oversee your life, to help shape your life. You know, Hebrews, um, it talks about in Hebrews chapter 7 and then uh, 13, it talks in those chapters. It says, don't, don't make it hard for your leaders. What good is that going to do you if you make it a hard time for your leaders? And what it's saying is your leaders are there to bless you. Your leaders are there to help guide you and take you somewhere. You know, I always thought about this, that shepherds have two legs and sheep have four, right? Why is it? So that the shepherd can have a little bit better vantage point to see the enemy coming. And how many of you guys know who the great shepherd is, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ? You know, when I look around this room, when Beth and I were here, you talk about legacy. Uh, I'm looking back at the sublets. I remember when the sublets, when we would have prayer over youth, I remember tears would run down Dennis's face. That was so impactful on me because I saw a man that was genuine, that was creating a legacy here at this church. Marty would get up and sing on the stage. Tears would roll down his face as he worshiped his God. And I watched a man with a pure heart sing. Carol is a teacher. I didn't get to see Carol this morning, but hi, Carol. Her impact as a teacher and the purity of her heart. I, I could go on and on. I mean, when you look at the legacy that's here at this church, it's simply amazing. God has moved in a powerful way here at this place. And guess whose hands that it's in now? Yours. Think about that. He says, listen, I'm going to trust you all with this church. And when I do find a leader, I'll place that leader and his family here. But guess what? Guess who does the work of the church? Guess who goes out and shares the gospel? It's you. It's the body. Listen, your pastor's not going to be perfect. Anybody ever figure that one out? I don't know if you knew that or not, okay? If you put your pastor up on a, a pedestal, he's going to fall eventually, okay? Understand your pastor, whoever comes in, is at the same foot of the cross as you. He's just got a different role in the body of Christ. And when you look at this, I don't know who God's got for you, but whatever it is, it's going to be a perfect fit for this legacy that you have at this church. I was telling the guys earlier We've been in West Plains for 25 plus years at the same church now. I've never seen anything like what we're seeing. We've had 35 plus families move in from Minnesota, Montana, Wyoming, Wisconsin, okay, everywhere. California, Illinois, as long as they don't bring their stinking taxes down. Is anybody with me? All right. All these places. And God sent them to our church. The very first church all these families ever tried was Endurance Church. They never went to another church. And every one of them, you can ask my wife, literally said, we're not going anywhere else. It's like family here. The very first church that they came to, we've never had that happen before. That, that's taken 13 years to set up, 13 years to get ready. So whatever it is that God's got in store for this church, you guys are the vital key to that in your prayers and your faithfulness and your giving. And when you look at legacy like this, this is so amazing to me. God says, take the pressure off of you. I want you to be obedient, but you got to understand, I will be the one who protects you. I'll be the one who takes care of your enemies. I'll be the one, if they curse you, they're not cursing you, they're cursing me, God says. And you don't want to deal with God. Is anybody with me? So when you look at that, the bigger picture here, five times he says that in those three verses. The point is that God's sovereign. 
that it's God's legacy and God's plan at stake. And so all he asks of us is to be obedient. When you look at this, we just have to walk in obedience to what his word says and then what the Holy Spirit impresses on your heart and the direction that he takes you. This legacy will be difficult. A matter of fact, I'm gonna show you in a moment, and, and this is the, the craziest thing I've ever seen. Go ahead and pop that map up. I, I know I've got another verse there, but I want you to see this map. This is the map where God called Abraham from Ur over here and Canaan was all the way over here. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see this map. Why in the world did this guy go do an up, upside down U? Is anybody with me? If you look at the bottom of the map, would it not have been a lot easier to go straight across? I, I mean, I would think so. So Springfield, Missouri is 100 miles from us. I could not imagine walking that and walking back. It's long enough in a car. It takes us an hour and 45 minutes to get there. But we, when we get in the car, we want to go, right? You guys go to Little Rock? I would say my Springfield is your Little Rock probably, right? That's probably where you go for a lot of stuff. There's a certain route you want to go to get there quick, isn't it? Okay, I think so. So, yeah. And when you look at this, what was God doing here? This is so amazing to me. The Bible says, I will show you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Watch what the Bible says right here. He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. This wasn't Abraham's idea. Matter of fact, when you think about it, he did not have any land to go to. God had to take him to his land. So everything was based on faith with him. And what a journey that was. I, I would think that it'd be so much faster to go straight across instead of do a big upside down you, right? But if you'll look at your life, has God not taken you the same way? Didn't you think that it would have been a lot easier, God, to just be here and go straight across to here instead of do all of this, God. But see, God has a legacy at stake, and he's the one who will show you what you need to do. And so when you look at the scriptures here and you look at that map, it's amazing to me to see. Genesis chapter uh, 15. If you look at Genesis chapter 15 real quick, the Bible says this. And when you see these uh, scriptures, I may have put the wrong reference. I may have put Genesis 12 on there instead of 15. The oak, I did. The oak of Mora is what it's called. So on that map, the Bible says this. It says, when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem. You read these scriptures and you're like, okay, I don't care about that. But then it says this. Then he went to a place called the oak of Mora. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Now, I'm gonna have you guys do something. Sorry. Can you pop that map back up? Watch this. So as he goes up and he's coming around, on that journey up there was the Oak of Mora. Abraham, for the first time, got a taste of what the Canaanites were like. The Oak of Mora was this massive, massive oak tree. And all the soothsayers and the fortune tellers and witches would sit there. And as the wind would come through and rustle the, the leaves on there, then they would tell a fortune for whoever was there. So a couple things are happening here on this journey. One, God is showing Abraham what he's up against. The second thing is that God is showing these people that there is a real God that's in the land now and not all these demon gods. Make sense? What if God would have never taken Abram up to the Oak of Morah and just let him go straight across? Those people would have never heard about the God Jehovah. Think about that, church. That's, that's an incredible thing. You may be here this morning and go, hey, I'm on a journey, and man, I may have screwed that journey up from time to time. Or it sure does seem like God's taken me on that big U. I sure would like to get straight across to where I need to be right now. Do you realize that God's in control? Even if you have been in a spot where you've screwed your life up a little bit, do you realize that when you go back to God and ask forgiveness, that his grace is more sufficient than that? That does not kick you out of his plan. It doesn't kick up a plan B. He has a plan for you. And the fact is this, we all make mistakes. We all do something stupid from time to time. Anybody besides me? Okay, there's a few of us in here. Yeah, all of us have. Did it kick you out of God's plan? No. Is there a legacy still for you? Absolutely. But right now you might be on that big you. And in our minds, God, it's so much faster to go from here to here. I remember we like to go down to Gulf Shores, Alabama. Destin, Florida is our spot when we go on vacation. And so the Memphis Bridge was shut down. Do you guys remember that? I think it was last summer. The Memphis Bridge was shut down. 
we ended up, we had some friends that sat there for four and a half hours because they got there during rush hour traffic. So we got smart. We left super early, all right? And so we, we used our brain. Listen, it was still an inconvenience because it had to take you all the way around all these detours. And let me tell you something, man. If you go down into downtown Memphis, anybody with me? I'm just telling you, okay? I had my Glock and my son had his Glock in the back seat. That's how bad it was. And I told him, I said, hey, you be ready, buddy, because we, it was stop and go through Memphis. All right, that is not the route we wanted to go. But did we get to our destination safely? Yes, we did. Did we get back safely? Yes, we did. There's going to be uh, different routes and different things that happen. And you have to make sure that you handle that route right and that you don't do anything stupid on the journey, on the route. Is it all peachy? No. You guys know where that huge, big white church is in, in Little Rock? When you come into Little Rock, it's a massive white church. I don't know what kind of church it is. But somehow or another, we were going, and I remember when we were youth pastors here, it took us down the wrong route into Little Rock. Anybody ever been to, down the long, the bad route in Little Rock? We could not find our way out. That was before GPS and phones were talking to us. Anybody remember the Atlas maps? Yeah, you're like, where in the heck are we? And uh, that person does not look real friendly right now towards us. Neither does that group. We could not find our way out. Man, we panicked. We were like, this is not good. But here's the deal. We made it. Okay, You're going to have different roads and different routes that you go in life. But the fact is this. God's with you. And he's with you through this entire process. And he's with you on your complete journey. When you look at these scriptures here, I think this is really interesting to me. Because when you look at these scriptures, God establishes legacy by leading you. But he also establishes legacy by elevating you. Wait a minute, Jerry. We're not supposed to be the ones that are elevated. I thought God was supposed to get the glory. He does. But do you realize in these scriptures? Let's take a look at it again. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I will make you into a what kind of nation? Great. He's telling Abraham, this is what I'm going to do for you. Okay? And, and watch this. He says, I will bless you and I will make your name great, Abraham. He's elevating Abraham. Watch this. He says, I will bless those who bless you. Anybody who dishonors you, I will curse. What he's doing is he's elevating Abraham so that God can work through Abraham for a legacy and then God get all the glory for it. There's one thing I learned when I started ministry and that was this, you do not take any of God's glory. You don't do it. Because when you begin to take God's glory from him and you begin to get the glory for it, you're in trouble. You're, you're in bad trouble. Roy Rhodes, I was just talking to Gabe and Nathaniel about Roy Rhodes this morning. He was our district youth director here in Arkansas while I was youth pastor. Roy, um, he, he let me speak a youth rally, and I spoke at Batesville, uh, Southside. We had a great time. And he came up to me afterwards, and he said, Jerry, he said, I know you're, you're young. He said, but you did a fantastic job, but let me tell you one thing. He said, you need to do a crown toss every time you preach. And I was like, what's that, Roy? And he said, every time you preach, you do not take any of God's glory. Now, he said, you didn't do that. But let me tell you, since you're young, don't take any of God's glory. When you preach, you, take, you do a crown toss. You toss that up to God and say, God, to you be all the glory in Jesus' name. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling anybody they did a good job. There's nothing wrong with telling somebody, listen, man, I'm here for you. Man, that was great. That changed my life. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you begin to take glory away from God, you have set yourself up to become God's enemy. And church, you don't want that. You don't want that. You know, it's pretty interesting. I've spoken at a lot of churches over the years. I was assistant district youth director for the state of Missouri. So I got to go speak at a lot of youth groups, a lot of churches. I'm going to tell you something. When I came in here watching your hospitality, I'm an observer. Even though I was talking to everybody and catching up, I was observing. Everybody was smiling. Everybody was, was being friendly. You know, if you think Disney is the friendliest place on the earth, nope, it's this place right here. Is anybody with me? Yeah. And, and when you think about this, you guys have a legacy to protect here. Listen, we live in a day and age. I'm just going to shoot you blunt because that's who I am, okay? We live in a day and age where I cannot believe that we are even questioning as a nation or a people that there's 50 different genders. It is unbelievable, Please hear me, okay? I'm not gonna get off on some political stunt, but I will tell you this. The Bible that you hold in your hands and the Bible that you believe says that God created a male and a female. And that's it. It's not real hard to understand, okay? 
So you have to protect that legacy because that legacy is getting erased. It's not real hard to understand. Then God goes on and he says, hey, when I made male and female, I went ahead and gave the, the female to the male because the Bible says this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and then he will go, they will, those two will be joined as one and then guess what? They're married, male and female. It's not real hard to understand. We had somebody a couple months ago come by and say, listen, Jesus never spoke against homosexuality or transgenderism. Yeah, he did. Matthew chapter 19, he made it clear as day. He said, haven't you read in the beginning what the scripture said that God created male and female? Jesus reiterated that he didn't have to speak on homosexuality or transgenderism. He was showing it plain as day. This is what God created and this is what God expects. And he says, haven't you heard the scriptures from the very beginning? Nothing's changed with this. God created male and female. This is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife and joined to his wife, and the two become one. And then he says this, you do not let anyone separate that. Do not let anything or anyone separate or get in the way of that. And right now, listen, if you've got family or friends that are caught up in this, you need to love on them and pray for them. But you need to tell them the absolute truth from the Bible. People are doing these people no good if they're not telling them the truth that they'll stand before God one day. The Methodist church right now, that whole denomination has split in two. It's a huge growth. There's 2,500 pastors every single month that leave the ministry to never get back in to ministry ever again. That's the day and age we live in. So here's what I would tell you. We need to live this legacy out. God's got a legacy and a plan for your church, my church, for my city, your city. And it's, it, nothing has changed with this. He establishes le legacy by leading us. He establishes legacy by elevating us, by putting his favor upon us so people can see God. Did you know you're the only Jesus that people can see? People go, I want to see God. Okay. Take a good look at Russ. You just saw Jesus this morning. Is anybody with me? No, I'm just saying, you can see the heart. You can see the life change. You can see Jesus coming out. All the years I've known Dennis, as soon as I met Dennis, I saw Jesus. <laughs> Seriously, the compassion and the love and the kindness. Listen, people see Jesus through you. Really, you're Jesus with skin on. Not trying to be weird with that, but they see Jesus through you. You're the only picture that they see. What does he look like? You know, in closing today, God establishes legacy by working beyond you. He's going to work through you, but he's going to work beyond you. There's a big picture. And so when you look at this, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says this. And again, this is so incredible to me that when you see these scriptures here, he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will dishonor those or I, those who dishonor you. I will curse. But then he goes on and he goes on to say this. He puts it in and he says this, he says, in, in you, Abraham, in you, all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed. I want you to think about that. The reason you and I are here today is because Abraham was obedient to God. Jesus was the only one who fulfilled the entire promise of Abraham, Hebrews says. And church, when you think about that, that's an incredible thing. Because is he done, is he done with Jesus? No. Is he done with the book of Acts? When the book of Acts and the early church exploded? No, no. There, there's something God wants to do here through this church in this city and area, and he's gonna use you, and he is using you. I promise you. I mean, I, I, again, I've watched online different things. You guys get it. You, you get it that Jesus is in charge. You get it that if you'll follow him, he'll open the doors that you could never open, and he'll shut the ones that you don't need to go through. So back in the day, there was this tall, skinny kid named Josh Yancey. Anybody know Josh? Named Josh Yancey. He really didn't want to come to church or youth group the first couple of times. But then we got to talking a little bit and he started to come. He gave his life to Jesus and then got into our discipleship group. I don't know, Jared, Nathaniel, I don't know if you guys remember this, but we did a discipleship group called Take Pride. And we learned a bunch of scriptures and Josh jumped right into that. So when Beth and I ended up leaving in, in 1998, January, um, we tried to stay in touch with people. But you guys know when everybody goes separate ways, everybody's busy. And even if you have Facebook, it's still hard. 
But all of a sudden, I get this phone call from my daughter. 20 years later, she's in college at James River Leadership College in Evangel. And she goes, Dad, um, do you know some guy named Josh Yancey? I said, I do. And she goes, he's my professor, my college professor. Okay. So she went through a couple semesters with him on leadership. And she could get up here and tell you from this microphone today, it was the most impacting professor that she has ever had during all of her college years. Josh Yancey. So what I'm here to tell you is this. Beth and I never knew that Josh would get saved one day at the youth ministry. We never knew that our daughter would go to college and guess who would be her professor? Josh Yancey. Josh Yancey came and he came and taught at our church. I had him in on a Sunday morning before he moved out to Colorado. What the heck is he thinking? Is anybody with me? <laughs> They've got a great church out there called Timber Creek that, that he's a part of. But he came and he spoke and he shared about how he got saved in the youth ministry and how God led him on this journey. And then he got to pour into our daughter. And all I'm saying is this. After all of these years that my wife and I have been gone, God had it all set up for Josh and Caitlin to meet. And something happened in Josh's heart. And it, it went around full circle, this legacy. So there's legacies that you're never going to see. It's going to be passed on, but there's legacies that you can see. And I wanted to share that with you today because I'm here to tell you this. You don't know what kid was just sitting in here that's going to be the next whatever for God. And you have a part in pouring into those children and youth. You never know. And church, that rests on our hands. When I heard that Carol was teaching, she was teaching when I was here. <laughs> she was. But you know what? That's her gifting and that's in her heart. To, to share the word of God for, uh, to people so they can grow and become who they need to be. And guess what? That legacy is going to be passed on. Who's the next person that's going to take her spot one day? Who's the next person that's going to be up here leading worship, playing keyboard one day, or drums? I, I want you to think about that. Is that legacy going to die with you, or is that legacy going to continue on? Because at our church in Endurance in West Plains, we've raised up leader after leader after leader intentionally Listen, I'm going to be gone speaking four times in the next month and a half. Four times from my Sunday morning. Okay? The reason I can do that is because I've got leaders that we've raised up. I don't even think about it. When I first took over there, we couldn't even go on vacation for a week because I thought, oh, man, this is going to be a bad deal with some people. <laughs> Anybody with me? we got some people that have agendas and motives, and they're not good. We never got to rest on. Now I could be gone for a month and be like, oh, yeah, endurance church, praying for you guys. Love you, right? And raise up leaders. Continue that legacy. The reason I'm here with you this morning, my youth pastor speaking this morning. We've raised up leaders. We're very blessed at our church for the first time at our church. All of our pastoral staff and staff have been raised up through our church. It's been awesome. And, and there'll be a day of that as you raise up leaders, but it takes time. So here's what I like to do. If you're a leader and you, you pray uh, at the services or whatever, would you guys come forward this morning? I, I want to open this up for prayer today. And what I want to share with you is this. When you fast forward through legacy, who knows what's going to be here in a decade? Who, who knows? Who knows what's going to be here in 20 years? What kind of church is this going to be? I, I, I don't know, but I do know this. The people that are here right now that are setting the legacy and the tone for this thing, this is an incredible thing. Some of you came this morning, and you're very frustrated with your journey right now. Some of you came this morning, and you're like, I saw that map, and that man, I'm somewhere up in that big U, but I want to be there. Some of you need to give that to God today and put it in God's hands and let him lead you. As a church, you need to place this in God's hands that God has the right person for you and the right family coming in to be your pastors. Do not worry about it. God's got this. If God feeds the sparrows, you think he can take care of this church? Absolutely. Why? Because his legacy is at stake. Would you shut your eyes this morning with me? And those of you that don't come up for prayer, let's worship together. But if you need prayer this morning, maybe your dreams have been shattered. Maybe you say, I'm not on the right road that I need to be on. Maybe today something has sparked in you to get on that right path again. Listen, you have a legacy, not just for you and your kids and your life, but for God. It scares me to think one day when we stand before God, right? But does it really have to scare us as a believer? No, it doesn't. 
we do this thing right, the Lord can move in a powerful way. Heavenly Father, God, we join together this morning to pray. Lord, you, you have legacy on this earth by leading us. You have legacy on this earth by elevating us. But God, you also have legacy because there's a bigger picture beyond us. And right now, this church is investing in youth and kids and one another. Father, but individuals in here today are broken. Lord, I pray today that not one person leaves this place that's broken, that you can heal their hearts, that you can get them on that path that you want them to be on. It's not an accident that anybody's here today. You had this day ordained before time began, the Bible says. It's not an accident who's here today. Would you heal hearts? And God, would you take broken roads and put them on the right road, I pray. I pray that no one misses out on this moment. If we'll put it in your hands today, you'll do miracles and you'll heal people's lives. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't